Good afternoon. My name is uh, Sheila Watson. I'm Deputy Director of the FIA Foundation, which is a UK-based philanthropy seeking to support safe and sustainable mobility globally. And I'm very delighted to chair this press event, at which the Partnership for Active Travel and Health, which from now we'll call PATH, uh, which is funded by the foundation, the FIA Foundation, and led by the European Cycling Federation, the ECF, Walk 21 and the UN Environment Programme with several hundred members and affiliates from across the mobility sector. And PATH is today launching some interesting new research on the walking and cycling policy performance of the ITF countries gathering here today, this week in Leipzig. In conceiving of the PATH initiative and developing it with a group of key stakeholders in the walking and cycling sectors, the FIA Foundation is acting on a very clear imperative that faces all of us. Uh, and that is that the climate crisis cannot be addressed by electrifying our fleet alone. Uh, and that is at the moment, one of the most popular silver bullets, which we're discussing, we're discussing, sorry. Uh, and that simply isn't gonna bring the carbon savings that we need. Instead, our actions must involve promoting and protecting the zero carbon options of walking and cycling, uh, which as other PATH research released at the end of last year has shown, uh, are capable of fulfilling at least 60% of the journeys that we all take every day. Uh, the fact that that mode also brings other benefits, better health, improved air quality, and so on really only adds to the appeal. Um, however, it's fair to say, I think, that these modes have been somewhat neglected in the debate and in policy terms uh, around sustainable mobility. And so PATH is very keen to change that, uh, both uh, in identifying where more needs to be done, but also, really importantly, in celebrating what's already underway. And that's what this report does. Um, and it enables us to amplify and to share that good work uh, and the work of the member organizations of PATH so that we all understand the benefits and we can all help to make the change. And so I'm absolutely delighted to have with us today um, the Secretary of State for Urban Mobility from the Republic of Portugal, Jorge Delgado, uh, to celebrate the work that is happening in Portugal, work which is described in the report uh, and which I look forward to him telling us an awful lot more about just now. And once you've spoken, uh, Secretary of State, we will turn to Jill Warren, CEO of the European Cyclist Federation, and then Bronwyn Thornton, CEO of Walk21, after which there will be plenty of time for questions. And that applies to the, oh gosh, 20 plus organisations currently online. I think you have to put your questions into the chat or some such place, and I will chase them. So thank you, and over to you. Our Secretary of State. 
Well, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for this invitation to be here and joining you in this moment of the presentation of this so important report. So congratulations to the, um, to the Partnership for Active uh, Travel and Health, to the work you have done, um, producing, making a report that highlights the, the uh, the results of uh, and, uh, and the insights from a global analysis of 64 countries, including Portugal, we are proud of it. Um, and so a very, very important instrument of analysis and, uh, and inspiring for policies. Um, and um, uh, we are proud in a certain sense because um, uh, we are totally aligned and uh, we recognize ourselves in the results of this um, this report. Uh, and that's because Portugal decided uh, three, four years from now to push uh, uh, and give the real importance that it that it has uh, to active mobility, either cycling or or pedestrian or walking. Um, and uh, looking at this from different point of view, namely as an instrument for a sustainable and decarbonized mobility ecosystem, of course. Uh, and why is that so so important? Why is that so important having um, policies and, and investments and measures in, in active mobility? Uh, I think we can identify two types of, of, of good reasons. The first one are the, the direct benefits of it. They are obvious. Um, active mobility is synonymous of improvement of health conditions uh, uh, by fighting the, um, the sedentary, sedentary uh, lifestyle, of course, but also conditioning factors of um, mental disorders. Uh, secondly, because um, active mobility is something that push and lead us in, uh, in the direction of the creation or more safe and more pleasant cities um, with uh, safer urban spaces for all generations and including for those who have reduced mobility. And finally, because um, in stimulating this kind of active mobility, we are uh, creating and, and strengthening uh, close relationships between locals and contributing to uh, social uh, um, well-being and also the, the flourishing of, of um, local economy. And these are mainly the, the the three main ideas, I think, to that of the direct benefits of active mobility. Of course, we have the others. We have the the indirect uh, uh, that are, uh, uh, according to our view, um, the result of uh, uh, the, the the following situation. We think that we must achieve a more sustainable mobility. We all agree with that. And I think the most of us or all of us agree that tra public transport must be something that is the backbone of the system and uh, must be implemented. But uh, public transport don't goes to every place and everywhere. And of course, the most, the more normal uh, way of complement the, the, the use of um, public transport is, of course, our uh, the, the the option of uh, of uh, of using um, a walk or, or uh, use a, a bicycle to complement uh, this trip that we need uh, to do uh, um, all, uh, everywhere. So um, that's why, um, the, for all these reasons, as I said in the beginning, that we start to implement uh, to to. To define strategies, concrete, uh, real, concrete strategies for these both types of uh, active mobility. Um, in 2019, we approved the national strategy for active mobility, cycling active mobility, um, that um, uh, uh, had the vision um, to create a proudly active country where cycling is a safe and widely practiced activity. It's a it's a, a message that we want to pass. And more recently, uh, we we finished and we are going to approve it in in one or two weeks. I hope the the um, the, the national strategy for uh, um, pedestrian per walking mobility uh, that uh, as a as a vision also we are all pedestrians and uh, trying to to push this this kind of uh, uh, way of moving so um 
combining these two uh, in policies in instruments, uh, we think we have the, the perfect combination to uh, go on and to implement it, we decided to create a, 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 an executive committee that are going to have three persons that uh, will be totally dedicated to the implementation of these strategies. We know when strategies are um, produced and then uh, those who are responsible to the implementation uh, have many other responsibilities. Sometimes strategies uh, stay back and we want to, to push it, creating an executive committee to implement these strategies. And uh, well, uh, let's hear about the, the report. That's the important thing once again. Congratulations for to, for the work that you have done. Um, that is a very, very important work and a very inspiring work for, for the conduction of our policies from now on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Secretary of State Delgado. And without wishing to be at all contentious, you're quite wrong. The really important thing is the work that's actually happening in countries being led by politicians such as yourself. Uh, but I will now pass over to Jill to begin an explanation of what the report shows. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, Secretary of State uh, Delgado. That was uh, excellent that you could come along um, as, as one of the uh, case studies highlighted in the report to uh, explain what you're doing. Um, so getting back to the report, why is a report like this needed? Why is it important? Um, simply because walking and cycling have enormous further potential and they deliver important co-benefits that we don't get from other modes of transport. So, um, you know, PATH has been looking at this since we formed last year. And one of the first things we did was to produce a report that brought together all of the evidence out there that makes the case for walking and cycling. And this report was called Make Way for Walking and Cycling. And this slide here illustrates some of the findings in that report that I think are very relevant to uh, why this is so important. So as, as Sheila mentioned, 60% of urban trips taken today um, could be done uh, by walking or cycling. Uh, so they're less than five kilometers and a quarter of those are even less than one kilometer. And more than half of those short trips we know are currently taken by motorized vehicle. So, so much potential uh, to, to take them in a more sustainable way. Not only that, if you factor in the absolute game changer that e-bikes are proving to be uh, all across uh, the world, really, then um, you get up to 75% because people are very willing to uh, travel a bit further uh, on e-bikes. They make hills flat. They do all of these things that, that make uh, this kind of mobility even more of an option. And so that gets us up to uh, a potential of about 75% of urban trips that could be easily done uh, by walking and, and, and cycling in, in all its forms. So, uh, you know, beyond that, the other co-benefits are so very important to the climate conversation, to the livability conversation, it's air quality, it's congestion, it's road safety, it's combating uh, physical inactivity. So about 28% of people worldwide are estimated to be not physically active enough. And uh, cycling or walking 30 minutes a day um, you know, gets to the WHO guidelines uh, for physical activity and will save countless uh, premature deaths uh, by the, the increased physical activity that, that we can get with, with more walking and cycling. So promoting walking and cycling is truly a healthcare policy in addition to a, a transport and a mobility policy. Um, so for all of these reasons, we think that uh, it's important, but but not only that, you know, we can give economic arguments uh, as well. So we know that uh, cities that are more walkable and cyclable are also um, very economically vibrant. You know, shopkeepers will um, note higher sales where there's increased foot traffic and where people can go to the shops uh, by foot or, or by bike, which is counterintuitive to the way most people think about that uh, beforehand, but uh, you know those uh, arguments and pieces of evidence are there as well. Um, but you know, as Sheila also said, uh, walking and cycling are under-prioritized in the mobility mix and in that wider climate agenda. They are currently not treated everywhere as fully-fledged modes of transport. 
And that means that they're not given the priority or the funding or the attention that they deserve and that uh, they don't have their rightful place in that mobility mix that, that we would like to see. So PATH very much seeks to draw attention to that, to highlight that, and this report is really all part of that. So um, national walking and cycling policies, we think are a very important piece uh, of that. And you know what were we looking for? So also going back to the first report that we produced, um, where we said, okay, what's needed to have the right conditions for more walking and cycling in, in our uh, cities all around the world, we think it starts with uh, infrastructure, quite frankly. So we need to have the infrastructure that makes walking and cycling safe, accessible, and easy to do to make it a very viable choice for people. Um, but then we also need campaigns. We need campaigns that help support a shift in people's mobility habits and to reinforce uh, that kind of a, a choice. We need the right land use planning uh, policies to um, make sure that uh, we can ensure the proximity and the, the quality of access to everyday services on foot and by bike. The integration with public transport is really important to underpin sustainable mobility for longer trips, uh, for example. And capacity building is also a, a very important part of that to enable the successful delivery of effective uh, walking and cycling strategies that have measurable impact. So we think the perfect walking or cycling strategy would uh, have all of those elements. And, and so that is uh, something that we looked at in, in the report. Um, so a bit on the methodology before I turn over to, to Bronwyn to explain further. So, um, FIA Foundation very generously funded the initiatives that we were able to do this research. Walk 21 Foundation coordinated a team of postdoctoral researchers to look at the 64 um, ITF countries uh, to identify and evaluate uh, the policies uh, where they existed um, with the support of the European Cyclists Federation. And in both cases, this built on some work that each of our organizations had previously done, but this allowed us to really bring it all together and do that thorough look across uh, the, the ITF. Um, yeah, so we mapped uh, uh, the policies in terms of their status and timeframe, ambition and objectives, actions and investment, and evaluation and impact. And we found some interesting things there. Uh, and the research was conducted in the first quarter of this year. So I'll turn over to Bronwyn now to, to tell us more. Great, thanks, Jill. Thanks everyone for the perfect segue. Great. Uh, so. I get to share the key findings. You'll get all the details and all the numbers in the report. It's available online. We have some hard copies as well. Um, but if anyone who knows me, we like good news. And there is some good news that comes out of the report, which is that the majority of ITF countries are actively supporting the PATH call in terms of the elements that Jill's already identified to create integrated and coherent strategies policies, plans, funding, and concrete actions for walking and cycling. So when we um, identify this, we're looking across the spectrum of different types of policies um, and assessing them against those criteria. So we're delighted that so many have something in place, but there is always almost everywhere something more to do. And on these detailed graphs, which you can find in the report, you can see that we defined specific uh, national walking policies. So we have in this slide, 14% of countries actually have a specific national walking policy, but 58% have something similar in, in place. Some are out of date, some are under development, and some we couldn't actively find in the process. And we're always willing to be proved wrong in this situation, and things move and change all the time. Um, and we know that since the COVID pandemic, it's one of the key impetus for the development. There's been a real uptake um, of developing walking policies in response to that COVID pandemic. So we are very happy to update this map or to change the color of your country if you want to tell us that we've uh, that we've got it wrong. On the cycling front, interestingly enough, not as many have as, uh, what we framed as a cycling policy in place, 45%. 
But what's interesting here as well is that uh, there's more underdevelopment and um, some have been there before and need updating. So it's overall a positive picture, but there's some, there's some work to be done. I just wanted to share with you a couple of headline things about that have come out of the report because the walking and cycling agenda, the path agenda spans across different ministerial responsibilities. So it can be picked up by transport, health, sports agendas, the environment agenda. And so these multiple portfolios all have a role to play. So we are pleased to see that in 59% of these countries, the leadership comes from the transport ministries. And I'll be really plain about that. It's because the transport ministries have the budget and have the means for building the systems and infrastructure that we need to support more walking and cycling. Health wants this to happen. They've wanted it to happen a long time. And Ireland has a brilliant national strategy for promoting and supporting more walking, but they can't build what we need built. And so we're delighted that 59% uh, are led by transport ministries. Road safety is the common objective, the common motivation for the ambition inside of these strategies. And we take nothing away from that, but we know that these modes are more than road safety. It is about mode shift and it is about climate change mitigation. These are the top three um, ambitions and motivations for the strategies. And all of them conclude commitment to action. So this is reassuring that whether the action is happening or not is another conversation, but right now the commitment to do, actually do something is there. And in terms of level of funding, you can see this is where cycling's winning. They have 78% of their policy, 76% of their policies have funding commitments or dedicated budgets, whereas only 28% of countries with walking policies currently have the funding for, for delivery. And what's interesting in the, the differences between walking and cycling is very often countries start with cycling. The pan-European region has done the same thing, pan-European pan regional master plan. They've got a stronger lobby group, but they come back and they expand the role of that department or that, um, that person, very often a singular person, to expand into the, into the walking space. I'm just going to go leave it on this one, to expand into the walking space. So we're seeing some really positive things. Since COVID, there's been a real momentum for walking and cycling nationally. The pan-European region is doing regional planning at a national level. The African region is doing the Pan-African Action Plan for Active Mobility, otherwise known as PAPAM, also looking at the national level around supporting that. The great thing is that most countries have adopted the five actions that we promote in PATH, and we can see as per the national example from Portugal, really solid, sound policy frameworks to deliver for walking and cycling. The other example that we share in this report is from Ireland. Ireland doesn't have a national policy per se, but they have a really impressive investment program. And it's that dedicated funding, that demonstrated commitment to walking and cycling, that delivery framework in terms of capacity building and staffing that we're seeing in Ireland having impact. And a lot of the um, policies have a five to 10 year time frame. So this is the window in which they're committing to act. And so this is the window which we'll be back to check and see how, how things are going. And so to lead from this moment, because this is just our first report and you'll see on the map that there are some blank countries. That's because we haven't done them yet. We've started with ITF. This is where we are. We've done 64, but our postdocs are not gone on holidays. Our one's gone on honeymoon, but the rest of them are still there working away. He is literally on his honeymoon um, and they're working away. We're doing all of the countries. We're going to collate the entire global uh, report and lead forward to uh, developing the relationship between this national agenda and the climate agenda through the nationally determined contributions looking towards COP. So you'll be hearing again from us with a fuller package um, as we go. The other thing that is really exciting with this momentum at national level is um, we're growing programs to support and train the officers that have to deliver this, the pan-European region, we're building national policies underneath the, the master plan that is growing across the top of all those countries. So we're not waiting for the master plan and then coming and doing the national ones, we're capacity building and, and developing those plans as we go. So for us, it's a really exciting agenda and we're delighted that we start with such a positive profile of what's happening in the ITF countries. Yeah, and and Bruno, maybe just to add to that, um, 
Also, one thing we're really excited about is we hope uh, that this report will inspire countries to really have a look. What are the neighboring countries doing? What more could we do? What can we learn from? And to get that conversation going. Uh, so we really hope that that happens as well. And we're very happy to facilitate that with the contacts we have. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much for presenting the work. And the only comment I wanted to add was just the unique nature of this work. It is very much the first of its kind to take walking and cycling together. We all use that phrase, but actually there's little analysis that truly brings it together uh, and even less analysis of what's already happening. So we hope this is a real contribution uh, to understanding on the issue. And as Jill says, to encourage people to take a look and compare and contrast themselves. Um, so at this point, we're able to take some questions. I understand there could be some online. That's why I have to go and stand at this computer but I don't think there are any. So if there are any in the room, please put your hand up. And I think there's a roving mic. Yes, which John has. Uh, and please go ahead. And obviously say who you are and where you're from, please. Hi, Philippe Christ with International Transport Forum. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Thank you for doing the work. Um, it's quite interesting results. Uh, I want to ask uh, Jill and Bronwyn, um, when you look at the types of policies that, that you found in this work, uh, did you look also at when they were put into place? And the reason I'm asking that is, do you, I sense that there's an acceleration perhaps of the policies coming in place. Did you see that in your work as well? Um, and I know that there's some policies that were just announced literally um, two weeks ago around the time of Velo City that are probably not in there, but do you feel that acceleration? And is that something, is that a lesson as well? First of all, the ones we knew about that we could call under development are um, categorized that way in there. Um, I can speak to the, the cycling aspect. So um, we've seen cycling policies all the way back to, you know, 20, 25 years ago or even earlier in some cases. Um, but it, it's also true to say that there's been acceleration and, and more of them in the past, uh, yeah, three to five years, and, and in particular, the, the pandemic and the um, master plan uh, process has catalyzed uh, more action there. Yeah, and in terms of walking, the first one that we were aware of uh, was the Norwegian National Walking Strategy, which was uh, in 2013, Gurberg came to the Munich Walk 21 conference uh, with the first National Walking Strategy, and they've done 10 years of rolling that out with a regional framework for delivery, um, and they're now looking to embed that into their broader transport uh, strategy, but that's only because they've done 10 years of active work and development. So from that, then there was Scotland and then Ireland developed their, um, under the sport and health agenda, their promotional um, action plan for supporting walking. It then sort of was a bit lull, a bit of a lull, but certainly in the last five years and pre-pandemic, we started to get inquiries about national strategies. And uh, there was a report done actually by ITF, by Veronique a few years ago, which has a really critic ch chapter seven, if anyone's looking for it. <laughs> it's a really great chapter to start with. And uh, we collated a range of resources and guidance for this, for when these requests were coming in. And they didn't just come in at the national level, but some of the big co countries with big regional governments like Australia with the state structure, the states came in and Australia's first sort of dedicated walking policy was done in Queensland as a, a state level transport um, body. But certainly we have definitely, in terms of the inquiries and the conversations that we have with people it's increasing uh, all the time and this the pet process in Europe has absolutely ramped it up because now it's it's bringing it to the table and we've got several uh, over 12 over a dozen countries signed up for training and for engagement in that process thank you uh, any more questions one more here my name is Glenn from Toronto so, oh thank you uh, I, I'm interested, uh, I had to look up uh, if Canada had a, a national strategy, and I, I'm pleased to say they do, embarrassed to say I didn't know about it, but uh, I'm interested in how uh, with something top down like that, you navigate the different levels of government, uh, because I'm used to these uh, solutions, if they come, uh, being addressed at a municipal level, but uh, I'm wondering how, the, how it works top down and then and from the bottom up. That sounds like a question, if you're happy to take Secretary of State, that you could opine on as the person who's actually delivering that. Yeah, leading with, with this um, situation of having different levels of uh, administrations is always 
a difficulty, to be honest. Of course, the responsibility are, are split between the different levels of, uh, of, of um, administrations. Uh, and uh, and the way that we are trying to pursue it is uh, it's is is in this case is the same as in other cases. Um, our role is uh, trying to define and trying to create uh, a standard, trying to create the mood, trying to identify uh, financial uh, platforms and ways. Uh, and uh, once we have uh, good relations with with the the, the the different levels of administrations, uh, we try to push them, uh, trying to um, improve, uh, trying to, to convince them that uh, uh, this this kind of policies are also them. They are not ours. They are ours, and and they, and they are uh, they are them too. Um, and uh, uh, that that. In the case of a country as Portugal, of course, we have a, a dimension. We are 10, 10 million persons, so it's not that difficult to to make conversations at different levels of administration. We have this tradition. Uh, we are, uh, since the last 10, 20 years, coming over and over uh, on a decentralized process of tra transferring responsibilities for the municipalities and the intermunicipalities and the metropolitan areas. Um, and uh, it's a work that must be done, uh, as I said, trying to uh, join them in the definition of the global policies, trying to identify uh, um, funds for for implement investments and try to involve them in the motivation global for this purpose that is common but uh, of course it's not uh, always easy absolutely anyone else want to add anything yeah um welcome from canada uh, we know quite a bit about the active travel strategy in in canada we've been hearing about it for a long time so it's good to see it in place um we one of a resource I wanted to point you to because the the layers of government and the challenges of implementation face every community as you've heard from Portugal and Canada as the provincial model is more like Germany or Australia which have uh, similar layers and different politics and responsibilities. What we've been doing at Walk 21, and you can find our YouTube channel, is that we've interviewed I think eight or ten actual officers involved in developing the strategies and taking on the challenges identified by the Secretary of State around ownership and engagement for the people who need to, to implement um, that work. And so the different political structures of your country will require a different process. And those, those interviews are very engaging around, and quite honest sometimes actually, about those challenges. And Ireland had a straightforward challenge because I had a single layer straight from the national government the money into local governments and off they went. Um, but other countries have bigger challenges and some of that is explored in those interviews on the YouTube channel. Um, and it's imperative that when you do it, even though it's top down, what you hear from all of those people is that it's only happened because they've worked with those other agencies and those other levels to ensure ownership and engagement. Could, could I just add to that? Please do, please do. Very, very definitely, there's no one size fits all. And um, I've been encouraged to see in the Transport, Health and Environment um, Pan-European Master Plan that that is something that the countries like to talk to each other about, you know, how did you deal with that? Um, you know, what was your model? And especially the more federalist, the more federal um, countries like Germany or Austria, you know, they have a lot to share with um, maybe a more top down like like France and, and how they did it. And it's very interesting to, to see them exchange about that. Great, thank you. Any more questions or thoughts or contributions? I, the people online, whose number I will tell you, um, are allowed to ask questions too, but there are none coming in. Oh. Sorry, so there are no questions coming in from those people. They're satisfied by our wonderful explanation of the work, by the Secretary of State's uh, explanation of what's happening in Portugal, which is impressive. And I think also really highlights the point that this report is very much about, which is it isn't a blueprint. It is about setting some broad principles and, and, and issues to be addressed. And then as you are doing in Portugal, uh, developing a policy which works for the people who have to use it and have to be part of it. And that's um, and that's what we're celebrating. And so it's great to have you here to do that. And thank you again, Secretary of State. So if there are no more questions and nothing more that anyone on the panel wants to add, I think that we're done. And thank you for coming. And do pick up a copy or a QR code if you don't want to have to carry it home. Thank you, thank you so much.